Investing in your own financial literacy might be one of the best investments that you can make. If you're watching my videos, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but around two thirds of adults worldwide are financially illiterate. Even in Canada, one of the most financially literate countries in the world, about a third of the population is financially illiterate. Financial literacy is broadly defined as people's ability to process economic information and make informed decisions about financial planning, wealth accumulation, debt, and pensions. Financially literate households are more likely to plan for retirement and have retirement savings, invest in higher expected return assets like stocks, and avoid high cost debt. Estimates derived from a stochastic life cycle model with endogenous financial knowledge accumulation suggest that an estimated 30 to 40% of retirement wealth inequality in the US may be accounted for by differences in financial knowledge. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital, and I'm going to tell you why financial literacy should be your most important investment. Financial knowledge is not free. Even though you're not paying to watch this video, you're investing your time. Gaining financial knowledge is an investment like any other skill, but empirically and theoretically, the returns on that investment are substantial. Empirically, people with low financial literacy have lower financial wealth even after controlling for other determinants of wealth like income, age, education, family composition, risk tolerance, patience, and attitudes towards saving. Financial knowledge increases the likelihood of investing in the stock market, which allows people to benefit from the equity risk premium. When they do participate in the stock market, less financially sophisticated households tend to exhibit stronger behavioral biases, hold a lower share of their portfolio in risky assets, hold under diversified portfolios, and tilt their portfolios toward volatile stocks with high share turnover and low institutional ownership, often referred to as lottery stocks. They also tend to have a greater bias toward home country stocks and the stock of their employers. By some modeling estimates, 30 to 40% of wealth inequality can be attributed to differences in financial knowledge, which helps people access higher expected net of fee return assets like stock index funds. Net of fees is an important qualifier. In a 2008 paper, The Cost of Active Investing, Ken French determined that investors spend 0.67% of the aggregate value of the market each year, or about $100 billion back in 2006, searching for superior returns, which most of them do not achieve, and the average investor definitely does not achieve. The least financially literate are the least likely to be sensitive to fees, so they're more likely to bear the higher costs of active management. The least financially savvy tend to incur high transaction costs, pay higher fees in general, and use high cost debt. In terms of its effects on financial outcomes, financial literacy is not the same thing as education more generally. Controlling for educational attainment in empirical models of stock holding, wealth accumulation, and high cost borrowing does not reduce the statistical significance of the effects of financial literacy. In other words, financial literacy appears to be a distinct form of education that contributes to financial outcomes beyond academic education. Importantly, as in many areas of knowledge, there is often a mismatch between people's self-assessed financial knowledge and their actual knowledge. Individuals who are overconfident about their financial literacy were found in one study to be more likely to believe that abnormally high returns, a classic attribute of scams, are attainable in investments. Overconfident people have been found to be more susceptible to financial bullshit, which is an academic term. Perhaps not surprisingly, overconfidence in financial knowledge is associated with greater propensity for fraud victimization, and those with low financial knowledge are less likely to detect fraud. Interestingly, and speaking of scams, people with low measured financial literacy who self-assess their financial literacy as high were found in a US sample to be more likely to own cryptocurrencies. Another study, spanning 15 countries, found that the financially illiterate are much more likely to own cryptocurrencies, and a study of Canadians found that Bitcoin ownership from 2016 through 2020 was concentrated among young, educated men with high household income and low financial literacy. In other studies, these same attributes are related to overconfidence and susceptibility to financial bullshit. Investing aside, financially literate people are more likely to engage in retirement planning and empirically those who engage in planning accumulate more retirement wealth. People with low financial literacy tend to have low financial well-being, which is measured on a scale based on control over day-to-day -day finances, financial freedom to make choices to enjoy life, capacity to absorb a financial shock, and being on track to meet financial goals. 
The instrument used to gauge financial literacy in many studies is a short set of questions covering four topics. Risk diversification, inflation, numeracy, and compound interest. Five questions were used in the S&P Global FinLit survey, which covered more than 150,000 people in more than 140 countries. People are considered financially literate if they demonstrate knowledge in at least three of four topics. In the remainder of this video, I want to make sure that you can answer all five questions and highlight the importance of the topics. If you find the questions easy, I hope it gives you an appreciation for the generally low levels of financial literacy in the population. The first question is, suppose you have some money. Is it safer to put your money into one business investment or to put your money into multiple business investments? Diversification is often referred to as the only free lunch in investing because when you add more imperfectly correlated assets to a portfolio, you can decrease your portfolio risk, at least measured by variance, without reducing expected returns. Typically in investing, decreasing risk also means decreasing expected returns. There are two types of risk to think about here. Compensated risk, where you earn an expected return for taking the risk, and uncompensated risk, which is a random risk that is not associated with a positive expected return. Diversification across lots of assets dramatically reduces uncompensated risk, which you don't want to be taking, while maintaining your exposure to compensated risk, which you do want. The next question covers inflation. Suppose over the next 10 years, the prices of the things you buy double. If your income also doubles, will you be able to buy less than you can buy today, the same as you can buy today, or more than you can buy today? The answer is the same. Relative to your income, which is also doubled, the cost of goods has not changed. Understanding inflation is important because the decreasing purchasing power of cash over time can be financially damaging. While there's often a perception that investing is risky, not investing can be even riskier when risk is measured as the probability of achieving long-term financial goals. Stocks are volatile at any horizon, which is often viewed as risk, and volatility can be scary, but over long horizons, stocks are more likely to beat inflation than safer investments like bonds or cash. This may explain why more financially literate households allocate more of their investments to stocks, which are volatile, but not necessarily risky for a long-term investor. Risk is nuanced and hard to measure. Numeracy, which is a fancy way of saying you can use math, is the next question. Suppose you need to borrow $100. Which is the lower amount to pay back? $105 or $100 plus 3%? The answer is $100 plus 3% since 3% of $100 is $3. Basic numeracy is critical in assessing decisions in everyday life. The last two questions are on compound interest and you only need to get one right to get the point for this topic. Suppose you put money in the bank for two years and the bank agrees to add 15% per year to your account. Will the bank add more money to your account the second year than it did the first year, or will it add the same amount of money in both years? The bank is going to add more money in the second year since they'll be paying interest on your initial investment and on the interest earned in the first year. The next question, suppose you had $100 in a savings account and the bank adds 10% per year to the account. How much money would you have in the account after five years if you did not remove any money from the account? The answer options are more than $150, exactly $150, or less than $150. The answer is more than $150 since 10% of $100 is $10, and we know we will get more than the simple interest of $50 in total due to compounding. Compound interest is part of the magic of investing. It results in exponential growth rather than linear growth over time. But it requires starting early and sticking to a long-term plan. If you have debt, compounding works in the other direction too. In both cases, understanding compound interest is important to making good long-term decisions. The increased incidence of under-saving, low exposure to high expected return assets, and higher exposure to high cost debt in less financially literate households could be explained by a failure to understand compounding. Improving financial literacy is a huge task. Even at the policy level, it's not obvious how to approach the problem because there is a theoretically optimal level of financial literacy knowledge for each individual. Financial literacy above that level is not a good investment. Someone with a full pension and low non-pension wealth, for example, has much lower financial literacy needs than someone with no pension and high financial wealth. I hope I've given you an appreciation for financial literacy as both an opportunity 
and a problem. While I don't expect to solve it with a YouTube video, maybe if everyone watching helps someone close to them understand the four topics of risk diversification, inflation, numeracy, and compound interest, we can make a small difference. Thanks for watching. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information.